Good evening. I want to welcome you to our third installment of our Arts and Humanities uh, fall program. Um, this, of course, is sponsored by the Foundation. Um, tonight, we have a local uh, favorite uh, historian, uh, Dr. Roy Heidecker. Of course, if you know him, you call him Doc, right? And um, Doc has been lecturing for us for many years on different topics such as the Civil War, World War II, great battles in history, and tonight is going to refresh our knowledge about George Washington, the father of our country. And that's why all of y'all are here, I'm sure, to hear him and hear about our first president and wonderful leader. Now, most of you are familiar with Doc. How many of you know Doc or have been to one of his lectures? Raise your hand. Well, I guess I'm just going to do this for about three people, okay? Um, yes, most of you are familiar with Doc, but those of you who are not, he served for almost 15 years as historian of the 4th Fighter Wing at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. He has his PhD in military uh, history and film from the University of Southern California. Doc also served as an artillery officer in the U.S. Marines. So not only is he a historian of the military, he was in the military. <laughs> um, today, he and his wife, Judine, are owners of classic aviation and war art. Um, he also provides lectures and programs for the Wayne County Public Library, the Wayne County Museum. Um, he's just very well known in the community. So please, um, uh, oh, let me give you just one teaser for next week, okay? So we've got two more lectures left, and next Monday at 5.30 in this room, we have Matthew Andrews, who's going to give us a um, the story of how baseball became as American as apple pie. And he is a professor from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he will be um, our speaker for the William S. Bretman Lecture. Um, he will also um, be representing Carolina Public Humanities. So don't miss that. How many baseball ball fans we got? Okay, so I hope to see some of you here then. And then um, at the end of our series is Scott Mason, the Tar Heel Traveler. The big difference with him coming is he's, we're going to meet in Moffitt Auditorium for that. So if you come, it won't be here. It'll be over there. Okay, so please, let's give a warm welcome for one of our favorites, Doc Heidecker. I don't, I don't know if I can go see Scott Mason or not. The last time he talked to me, I talked about how we almost blew up the eastern part of North Carolina. So I don't know if I want to see him again, or I don't know if he wants to see me. So I woke up this morning, and I said to my lovely wife, Judine, happy anniversary, 24 years. How cool is that? And, and then I said, happy Columbus Day. And then I said, happy anniversary of the taking of Redoubt 9 and 10, which you're all going to find out about. So George Washington, let's find out about this guy. In his amazing book, His Excellency George Washington, John Ellis began his book saying, it seemed to me that Benjamin Frank Franklin was wiser than Washington, Alexander Hamilton was more brilliant, John Adams was better read. Thomas Jefferson was more intellectually sophisticated. James Madison was more politically astute. Yet each and all of these prominent figures acknowledge that Washington was their unquestioned superior. Within the gallery of greats, so often mythologized and capitalized as founding fathers, Washington was recognized as primus inter pares, the foundingest father of them all. Why was that? Let us investigate this unquestioned superior this essential American. I want to st start off talking about an incident with Governor Morris. He wasn't a governor. Governor was his first name. So you can see it was spelled differently. 1987, a group of Washington's closest friends were talking about how even to them, he was reserved and remote. One of the group, Morris, 
vehemently disagreed. Alexander Hamilton dared him to greet Washington in a friendly and cordial manner. Hamilton would provide a lavish dinner for 12 if Morris followed through. While at their next gathering, Morris walked up to Washington, placed his hand on his shoulder and said, my dear general, I am very happy to see you look so well. Washington reached up, removed Morris's hand and stared at him in total silence. The flustered Morris retreated into the crowd no one ever tried that again. Washington's early life, born February 22nd, of course, we all know that, 1932, Pope's Creek, Virginia. His father, Augustine, had four kids from his first marriage. George was the oldest of six of the second marriage. Augustine died when George was only 11, so he could not be educated in England like his two older half-brothers. That, that was a real issue back then. From early on, George learned by doing. At the age of 16, he was a surveyor. He knew which was the best real estate, so by 1752, he owned 2,315 acres, mostly in the Shenandoah Valley, a young entrepreneur. 1753, he was a special envoy to the French, demanding they vacate their forts on the Ohio River. It's only 21. After a dangerous journey, Washington's report was published in Virginia and London. So he's starting to, to be known. French and Indian War, 1754, Washington is appointed a lieutenant colonel, sent back with a large force to confront the French. His forces killed some of the French, including their commander. This became the justification for the French and Indian War. George Washington started the French and Indian War. Additional Virginia troops arrived and Washington became the commander and a colonel. However, he was outranked by an obnoxious captain with a royal commission. Washington's forces were defeated and they retreated back to Virginia. This royal commission thing comes back and it's a real issue with Washington. A shuffling of the Virginia forces resulted in Washington losing his colonelcy and being offered the rank of captain. Rather than accept the lower rank, he resigned. Here's General Braddock. 1755, Braddock led a British force to expel the French from Fort Duquesne. Washington served as his unpaid aide in hopes of being granted a royal commission and to learn the tools of the trade. At the Battle of Monongahela, the British were ambushed by French and Indian forces. Braddock was killed and two thirds of the British forces were killed or wounded. Washington had two horses shot from under him and four bullets through his coat, but he was unscathed. Washington skillfully led the retreat. His previous defeats were largely redeemed by actions and this campaign. This is a painting showing Braddock's death. Washington's remaining service in the French and Indian War, he continued to serve in multiple campaigns. His attempts to gain a royal commission were unsuccessful. He was subjected to lower ranking British officers who outranked him because of their royal commissions. Washington was usually their superior in talent and experience, but he still had to follow their lead. In 1758, Washington resigned his commission and returned to his home at Mount Vernon. The war had honed his self-confidence, leadership, skills and military skills. He became an expert in British military tactics and realized they could be beaten. His impression of weak colonial politicians was not very good. Picture of George Washington, Martha, and the two kids. January 6, 1759, 26-year-old George married 27-year-old widow Martha Custis. They raised her children, Jackie and Patsy, they never had children of their own. However, they were an ideal match and loved each other dearly for the rest of their lives. Martha was extremely wealthy. George was already pretty rich, but now George was one of the wealthiest men in Virginia. Washington ran a large estate and genuinely enjoyed farming and family life. He saw how British merchants routinely bankrupted Americans through unfair practices. He also saw how the crown was preventing Eastern settlement, negating his holdings. So think about that. He owns all this land in the East and the crown is saying, 
no, you can't even go there anymore. That's, that's not gonna work with him. In order for the colonies to be successful, Washington was seeing the need to separate from England. Good old Ben Franklin, one of the most intelligent people who ever lived, one of the most famous Americans prior to the American Revolution because of his writings and his scientific discoveries. Helped write the Declaration of Independence as Minister to France, he helped seal the alliance. The great tragedy of Franklin's life was that his son William was an avowed loyalist. Bad guys. Even after the war, they never reconciled. But think about it, as extraordinary as Franklin's life was, he could never have fulfilled the role played by Washington. He was a great man. He was not, could not be the founding his father. Jefferson. Jefferson was the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, served as minister to France, and our third president. Brilliant man in many ways, he was also deeply flawed. He was constantly broken when he died, he was deeply in debt. Unlike Washington, he believed in slavery. During Washington's second term as president, he and James Madison undermined Washington in order to weaken the federal government. They did this because they feared a strong federal government would interfere with or even abolish slavery in Virginia. So even way back then, slavery is becoming an issue. Jefferson was admired, but again, could never be respected to the extent that Washington was. John Adams, he championed Washington to be the commander of the Continental Army, did this because initially the war was primarily in New England, and a Virginia commander would help bring the southern colonies into the war. So it wasn't just altruism that he did that. Adams helped write the Declaration of Independence, served as our second president. Much better educated than Washington, Adams was extremely intelligent. He was five feet, five feet seven inches tall and somewhat portly, a bit of a curmudgeon. He could never inspire the respect that was routinely given to Washington. I'm gonna talk about Washington's generals because it says a lot about him and how he dealt with this very significant issue. Over the course of the war, 28 men served as generals under his command. Knowing a little bit about them tells us a lot about Washington. Some of his choices were former officers in the British Army who had greater professional military experience than he did. This became a problem on several occasions. Because the colonies did not have a ready supply of experienced military officers, Washington often chose gifted amateurs with an abundance of enthusiasm. Many of these guys did really well. General Charles Lee. Lee was an Englishman, served as a British lieutenant in the French and Indian War, and then settled in America. He was a contender to be the commander in chief of the American forces, but Washington was chosen instead. He served as a major general under Washington. Lee was an eccentric who frequently was seen speaking to his always present pack of dogs. I'm the only one that's allowed to speak to his dog. As we shall see in his early capture, his early capture was his own fault. His conduct at the Battle of Monmouth almost cost Washington the victory. Again, we'll learn more about that. He was an example of the problem Washington had with British, former British officers. And here's another one, General Horatio Gates, also former British, also served in the French and Indian Wars. Yeah. Early on was known as an intriguer, maneuvering for higher command. He commanded the American forces that defeated Burgoyne at Saratoga in October 1777. But Benedict Arnold was the architect of that victory, and Gates prevented Arnold from getting any credit whatsoever, which kind of put Arnold on the course of becoming a traitor. Gates became involved with General Conway to replace Washington as commander-in-chief. The cabal failed. Gates' military career was finished after his disastrous defeat at Camden, South Carolina in, in 1780. Now, I find this totally fascinating. You're gonna learn about the 1783 Newburgh conspiracy. In that conspiracy, Gates pushed for Washington to be the king. So he wants to be the CNC instead of Washington, but at the end, he wants Washington to be the king of America. Henry Knox, gifted amateur, owned a bookstore in Boston, 
Read every book he could on military history. Of course, doesn't everybody? Formed a friendship with Washington over his shared interest. Knox was intelligent and had good judgment. John Adams, another good thing, recommended he be put in charge of artillery. Washington agreed. Wash Knox's contributions were essential throughout the war. Promoted a major general, Knox was by Washington's side in every major battle of the war. When Washington resigned in 1783, he chose Knox to be given command of the Continental Army. Knox was Washington's best choice of a talented amateur. Nathaniel Green, ex-Quaker from Rhode Island, commanded the Rhode Island Army in 1775, so he was a logical choice to be made one of Washington's generals. Served in Boston, New York, and the New Jersey campaigns. After Gates's defeat in Camden, Green was put in command of the Southern Campaign. Facing a numerically superior army under Cornwallis, Green waged guerrilla warfare against the British. Green won a series of victories, particularly at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. As a result of this loss, Cornwallis took his army out of North Carolina and went to Yorktown. General Mad Anthony Wayne. We all got to know about this guy, right? Wayne was born in Pennsylvania. As a youth, he was interested in all things military. When the war began, he was commissioned a colonel in the 4th Pennsylvania Regiment. Joined Washington in 1777, promoted to Brigadier General. He was known as a shrewd tactician and a bold and fearless leader in battle. Played key roles in the Battle of Brandywine, Germantown, and Monmouth. He became known as Mad Anthony because of his aggressiveness in battle. His victory at Stony Point, New York in 1779 was pivotal. He helped win the victory at Yorktown. And today, the finest county in America bears his name. <laughs> General Baron Friedrich von Steuben. Steuben served as a captain in the Prussian Army and was discharged in 1763. 1771, I'm not even going to say the name. I'd trip over it, made von Steuben a baron. 1778, Congress sent him to Washington at Valley Forge to be Inspector General. Prussian had a flair for disciplining and training the American soldiers, the formations and tactics necessary to stand up to the British in battle. His work made the Continental Army a much more lethal force on the battlefield. 79, Steuben Reuch, I'm sorry, Steuben, wrote regulation for the order and discipline of the troops of the United States used by our army until 1814. Played an important part in the Southern and Yorktown campaigns. He was one of our best foreign officers. Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette joined Journey to America in 1777. Congress made him a major general. Fortunately, when they met, Washington and Lafayette took an immediate liking to each other. Washington appointed Lafayette part of his staff. During the Gates-Conway attempted cabal, Lafayette was a fierce defender of Washington. Lafayette led his troops with distinction at the Battle of Monmouth, returned to France to garner support for the war, came back to take part in the Southern Campaign and the Battle of Yorktown. He and Washington were good friends and close throughout the war. He was one of our best foreign officers. Hamilton. Hamilton wasn't a general, but served as Washington's most important aide during the war. He was with Washington throughout the war, wrote much of his correspondence. Now, Hamilton had a quick temper and was abrasive, so the two had a falling out for part of the war. They reconciled, and Hamilton was in charge of the assault on Redoubt Number 10. Ah, there's that again, at the Battle of Yorktown. Hamilton became Washington's Secretary of the Treasury. His conflicts with Jefferson led to the rise of political parties, a fact, with, a fact with horrified Washington. A brilliant man, Hamilton never had the respect and leadership command that defined Washington. Early battles, not gonna talk about every battle in the war, well, we couldn't, so I'm just gonna kinda go over quickly some of the, the ones, especially the ones that Washington was not directly involved with. So Lexington Concord, April 1775, Congress selects Washington as the Commander-in-Chief, June 15, 1775, Bunker Hill, June 1775. Two days later, July 2nd, Washington arrives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
The British occupy Boston, but are largely surrounded by Washington's army. Henry Knox transports cannon from Fort Ticonderoga to Boston. Washington has them placed on Dorchester Heights, overlooking Boston. March 17, 1776, General Howe and the British evacuate Boston. Battles of New York and Long Island. This is the worst thing I'm gonna tell you about Washington all night. After the British evacuated Boston, Washington fought a series of battles in New York and Long Island. His plans were overly ambitious. His troops were not ready to stand up to British regulars. As Washington retreated, General Charles Lee compounded the losses by disobeying orders, hoping to supplant Washington as commander. Lee was a piece of work. Thanks in part to a fortuitous fog, which we'll learn more about, Washington's army escaped and retreated across New Jersey. This was a disaster. Very lucky that the Continental Army was not destroyed. The army was depleted and morale was low. Washington is desperately in need of a victory. I gotta tell you about this guy, Fabius. During the Second Punic War, any of you saw my lecture on Hannibal, 218 to 201 BC, the Carthaginian Hannibal had annihilated three Roman armies in a row. Quintus Fabius Maximus was made Roman dictator to deal with Hannibal. Rather than confront Hannibal directly, Fabius hit foraging parties, burned crops, used his interior lines to shield Rome, and hit small units of Hannibal when it was to his advantage. This is called Fabian tactics. Washington wanted to take on the British directly, but realized his Continental Army wasn't ready to do so. Somebody got that covered? There we go. He adopted Fabian tactics to hit the British Army when it was to his advantage. His primary goal was to retain an intact Continental Army, even if it were defeated. So it's okay to lose, but we can't lose the Army. Washington crossing the Delaware, Battle of Trenton. The revolution was about to collapse. Washington saw an opportunity. The British garrisons were scattered throughout New Jersey. On Christmas Day, Washington's forces crossed the Delaware River to attack 1,400 Hessian soldiers at Trenton. Despite numerous difficulties, the Hessians were totally surprised and the victory was complete. With the loss of less than a dozen men, Washington troops killed or wounded 100 Hessians and captured nearly 900. They also killed General Rawl, the commander. Think about that. We lose less than 12. We kill, wound, or capture over 1,000. Washington's gamble paid off. A much-needed victory was obtained, and the revolution was back in business. Fabian tactics were working. General Johann Rawl died in the battle. Battle of Princeton, shortly after the Battle of Trenton. Now, several thousand Continental soldiers were due to get out of the Army, but because of Washington, they agreed to stay. Washington targeted two garrisons of 1,200 British soldiers at Princeton. Again, the surprise and the victory were complete. British are routed, lose 300 prisoners and 150 men killed or wounded. By the time superior British forces were brought up, Washington's army had vanished, but they took lots of supplies on their, on their way back. The victories at Trenton and Princeton not only saved the revolution, but showed Washington how to successfully attack on his own terms. Painting of Washington at the time of Valley Forge. Valley Forge, winners 77, 1777 to 78, for the most part, in those days, armies did not do battle in the winter, but instead went into winter quarters. Washington chose Valley Forge because it was not too close to cities, but it was close enough to Philadelphia. The men built shelters, but obtaining sufficient food and clothing was a problem. The soldiers who remained were dedicated to the cause and to Washington. Von Steuben used this opportunity to drill the men in order that they be able to stand up to British regulars. Washington would continue to use Fabian tactics 
to strike at the enemy. But at the end of the winter, he had an army able to maneuver and fight in formation. Washington saying a prayer at Valley Forge. That's one of my all-time favorite paintings. Battle of Monmouth, 1778. Charles Lee, again, his forces were ordered to pin down the British rear guard while Washington's other forces attacked their flanks. Lee panicked and began to retreat. But good old Mad Anthony Wayne, his forces engaged the British and forced three British assaults to fail and retreat. Then British cavalry charged Wayne's regiment. Wayne had his men hold their fire until the cavalry was only 40 paces away. Think about that. You guys know how big horses are? You've got hundreds of horses and you wait until they're 40 feet away until you open fire. The volley shattered the charge and the British fled the field. Washington's Steuben trained army had defeated British regulars on an open field of battle for the first time. Washington would still choose his battles, but now he commanded a much more powerful army. Count Rochambeau, love this guy too. With France in the war, Lieutenant General Rochambeau was in command of the French army that arrived in Rhode Island in 1780. Rochambeau disagreed. Washington wanted to attack the British Army in New York, but they were too strong. But he still treated Washington with deference and respect. Now, when Rochambeau found out that Cornwallis was at Yorktown and that he had a French fleet available to come to Virginia and trap him, he very respectfully explained that to Washington so the Allies could go to Yorktown, besiege the British, and bag their entire army. Now, Washington didn't go, oh, no, I want to hit New York. Washington saw the genius of the plan and was totally on board. The respect between Washington and Rochambeau would lead to victory. Picture of General Charles Cornwallis. Came to America as a major general and participated in Washington's defeats in New York. Unsuccessful in trapping the colonial, colonial army at Princeton. August, that's supposed to be 1779, he commanded the Southern Campaign. At first successful, he lost key battles in the Carolinas, so he headed north to Yorktown. At Yorktown, Cornwallis was expecting reinforcements from the north. He felt his army was safe at Yorktown because the British Navy controlled the sea. British Navy always controls the sea. So he's thinking pretty smart. While this was the case, he could be supplied or reinforced, or if necessary, his army could be evacuated. So he, he wasn't doing anything really dumb. Talk a little bit about the siege and capture of Yorktown. When Rochambeau informed Washington that a French fleet under the command of Admiral de Grassi would arrive off Virginia to help trap Cornwallis, Washington readily agreed to shift the seat of war from New York to Yorktown. Some American troops stayed to convince the British that they were still there, but the rest of them and all of the French started marching to Virginia. De Grassi's fleet defeated the British fleet at the Battle of the Chesapeake. The Allied armies arrived and were joined by the forces there already with Lafayette, von Steuben, and good old Mad Anthony. All was in place for the final act of the war. Admiral Francois Joseph Paul de Grassi. This was one of the few people on earth who was actually taller and bigger than Washington. And when he, went, when he met Washington, he literally picked him up and said, ah, mon petit general, my little general. I would love to have been a fly on the wall for that one. Yorktown, six-week siege assaulted the trapped British army. Parallel lines were dug and a massive artillery assault rained on the defenders. On the evening, evening of October 14th, today, British, British redoubts 9 and 10. Redoubts were fortified positions with abatis and all kinds of, of construction to keep people and hundreds of defenders. So you had to get past these or possession of these to get close enough to Yorktown to get the heavy guns in to shell it. 
So nine and 10 were taken in furious attacks. The French took nine, and the Americans, led by Hamilton, took 10. With the artillery now so close, Cornwallis surrendered to Washington five days later. The British sought honorable terms of surrender, but American forces were denied similar terms when they surrendered Charleston earlier in the war. Washington allowed them only those terms. As 9,000 British troops surrendered, the bands played, the world turned upside down. Thanks to General George Washington, the world had indeed been turned upside down. British surrender. I want to look at Yorktown in perspective, because you can look at this battle and go, oh, that's so great, all the pieces came together. But think what it took to get there. Washington held his armies and the revolution together for six long years in order to get to the Yorktown campaign. Despite every obstacle, including battles lost, mutinies, cabals, and a relatively worthless Congress, Washington's leadership, faith, dedication, and perseverance brought his army, his ally, and his nation to the pivotal battle at Yorktown. The Treaty of Paris and the official end of the war would not occur for another two years. Before that happened, Washington had to deal with a final conspiracy that almost sent the revolution down a fatal path, the Newburgh Conspiracy. March of 1783, peace negotiation negotiations were underway, but a large British army is still in New York, while the Continental Army was in Newburgh, New York. A conspiracy arose among many American officers regarding their promised back pay and pensions. If Congress did not meet their demands, the cabal promised two potential courses of action. First was that they would march on Congress and obtain their demands through force of arms. If they did that, they wanted Washington to become their king, or at least a temporary dictator. It's like, why did we just fight a revolution? The second was to disband the army while the British army remained in America and allow England to win the war they had just lost. Washington was invited to address his officers. March 15, 1783, Washington entered a large wooden building to address his officers. Spoke at length towards the end of his speech, he stated, let me conjure you in the name of our common country as you value your own sacred honor, as you respect the rights and humanity, and as you regard the military and national character of America to express your utmost horror and detestation of the man who wishes, under any specious pretenses, to overturn the liberties of our country, and who wickedly attempts to open the floodgates of civil discord and deluge our rising empire by blood. How dare you guys even think about this? But Washington could see his words were not having the desired effect. Washington had shared the dangers and hardships of eight long years of war. He loved his soldiers and officers who had sacrificed so much. They loved him back, knowing that victory would have been impossible without him. Washington began reading a letter from Congress describing their financial difficulties. He pulled a pair of spectacles from his pocket and went to put on his spectacles. Seeing the surprise on the faces of his officers, no one had ever seen him wear glasses before. He stated, gentlemen, you must pardon me. I have grown gray in your service and now find myself growing blind. Many of the officers wept openly. The conspiracy collapsed. The officers asked Washington to continue to negotiate with Congress. In many ways, this was Washington's most important victories. Washington's farewell to his officers. Again, this is the, the man who is aloof and doesn't have great compassion. November 1783, the last British soldier left New York. On December, Washington bid farewell to his remaining officers. Many had gone home, too many were dead, and some had fallen in disgrace. Washington said, with a heart full of love and gratitude, 
I now take leave of you. I most devoutly wish that your later days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. Henry Knox approached Washington with his hand extended. Instead, while openly weeping, Washington embraced his friend and kissed him on the cheek and then proceeded to treat every single other man in the room exactly the same way. Then he raised his arm in a final salute and left the building. Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus lived around 500 BC. That's even before Fabius. Why are we talking about him? In the mid fifth century BC, Cincinnatus, a Roman farmer and senator, was made dictator in order to rescue a surrounded Roman army. Under his leadership, the Romans defeated the enemy in just 16 days. He was given a triumph in Rome. Then Cincinnatus relinquished his power and returned to being a farmer. Washington saw himself as the modern Cincinnatus. At the conclusion of the war, he immediately relinquished his command and returned to his two great loves, Martha and his Mount Vernon farm. He would have preferred to spend the rest of his life as a farmer. In May 1783, Henry Knox founded the Society of the Cincinnati in honor of Cincinnatus. Washington was chosen to be the President General and remained a member for the rest of his life. Mount Vernon, if you haven't been there, go tomorrow. Washington, Cincinnatus, returns to the farm. When Cincinnatus gave up his power, he spent the rest of his life in peace on his farm. In 1783, that was Washington's intention. He had been away fighting the war for eight long years. He loved his wife, Martha, and he loved his Mount Vernon farm. As time went on, Washington saw that the Articles of Confederation were too weak to hold the states together. The weak articles and Congress's inability to supply and pay his troops almost cost the nation the Revolutionary War. When called to preside over the Constitutional Convention, he knew that while the people were distrust, distrustful of a stronger federal government, they trusted Washington to lead them in the right direction. We the people. Constitution was written in Independence Hall between May and September 1787. The state sent delegates except for Rhode Island, which refused to do so. James Madison of Virginia is acknowledged as the father of the Constitution for his many contributions. There were twists and turns and compromises made in order for the Constitution to be accepted. Slavery was allowed to continue in order to keep the Southern states in the nation. Without Washington presiding, the states and the people would not accept a much more powerful central government. Trust in Washington gave them the ability to trust in the Constitution. The presidency. After the passing of the Constitution, Washington was unanimously elected president by the Electoral College. On the eve of his inauguration, he told Henry Knox, my movement to the chair of government will be accompanied by feelings not unlike those of a culprit who is going to the place of his execution. Once again, Cincinnatus was denied the opportunity to return to his farm. As commander of the armies, Washington's title was His Excellency. Most wanted equally lofty titles for the president, but Washington insisted he be called Mr. President. He was the leader of a nation, but he was a fellow citizen, not royalty. Everything Washington did as president was precedent setting. When the French Revolution broke out, France and England were again at war. Many wanted an active military alliance with France, but Washington knew that would not be in the best interest of the fledgling United States. As much as he wanted to return to Mount Vernon, Washington accepted a second term for the good of the nation. Having won the war and overseen the cre creation of the Constitution, Washington led the nation for eight years. No one else could have done this. Washington died on December 14, 1799. His last words were, "'Tis well." Without Washington, think about this. The revolution is likely hijacked. Now, what are the, most, the two most famous revolutions other than our own? 
Well, first, the French Revolution. And um, what's that up there? Oh, guillotine. Use that to cut people's heads off. Estimated between 15 and 17,000 people were executed by guillotine during the French Revolution. Most of these executions took place during the Reign of Terror. Included was Louis XVI, the King of France, and his wife, Marie Antoinette. There was ample hatred in America, particularly between the revolutionaries and the Tories. Washington's steadfast leadership and dedication to the ideals of the revolution ensured that the revolution did not veer off on a bloody and gruesome path. At the end of what was supposed to be liberty, equality, and fraternity, the French people wound up with their emperor and despot, Napoleon Bonaparte. Let's look at Napoleon's butcher bill. What was the cost in human lives for the Napoleonic Wars that came out of the French Revolution? Figures vary, but the estimated cost is astounding. Estimated 1,750,000 French soldiers died. 2,500,000 Allied soldiers died. Total of 4,250,000 dead soldiers. Civilian deaths estimated at 3 million. So because Napoleon was the last man standing from the French Revolution, over 7 million Europeans died. And remember, he didn't start the revolution he was the last man standing at the end. That's normally what happens when you have a revolution. What could be worse than that? Well, this could, by a whole lot. Russian Revolution. Started off with Lenin. He was in charge. But what happened? Well, got our good buddy Joe Stalin, our good buddy Lenin, and our good buddy Trotsky. Who winds up in charge? Ta-da! Joe Stalin. Now, let's take a look at Stalin's butcher bill. Comes to the slaughter of human beings, Stalin made Napoleon look like a slacker. Many of the deaths caused by Napoleon were not Frenchmen. Stalin primarily killed his own people. Stalin practiced genocide on a large scale using a variety of means. In addition to simple executions, Stalin had people killed through deportations, interrogation, forced labor, massacre, and state-caused famine on a massive scale, killed millions of Ukrainians. Stalin had executed the majority of his military officers prior to World War II, almost leading to Nazi victory in World War II. Estimated that Stalin killed over 23 million people. Yeah. Too bad they didn't have a Washington. What attributes made Washington the unquestioned superior, this essential American? His appearance and physical abilities, for starters. Six feet, two inches tall, extremely tall for that era. He was handsome, another good quality for a leader. He was known as an excellent horseman. Early in the war, a riot broke out between an all-white Virginia regiment and a mixed-race Rhode Island regiment. Washington rode into the center of the fray, dismounted, and picked up one of the guys with one hand and the other guy with the other hand. This display of strength and leadership ended the riot. In addition to his manly attributes of height, horsemanship, and strength, Washington was a talented and graceful dancer. At every ball, all the ladies wanted to dance with them, with him, and he willingly obliged. His physical attributes made him an easy to, easy to admire and respect as a leader. Now, I want to talk about Washington's luck. During his career, Napoleon Bonaparte was criticized for winning battles because of luck. He responded, I'd rather have lucky generals than good ones. Eisenhower said, I'd rather have a lucky general than a smart general. They win battles. Washington was a lucky man and a lucky general. Countless times during the French and Indian War and the American Revolution, in which he was in the midst of enemy gunfire and artillery fire, and yet, he was never injured in battle. There were numerous other instances in which luck played a hand in his victories. I had mentioned the Battle of Monongahela. I'm gonna skip through some of this. One Indian chief during the battle instructed his men to kill the officers, Washington in particular. Kill that big guy on the gray horse. 
He, the chief, was a good shot with a true rifle, fired at Washington 17 times with no result. He finally told his men Washington was protected by the Great Spirit, so stop shooting at him. Red Hawk, same battle, another chief fired at Washington 11 times. He also believed Washington was under the care of the Great Spirit, so he also stopped wasting his time. Washington's luck and the Long Island fog. Battle of Long Island, the uh, Continentals are, are in trouble. Much more powerful British Army is confronting them, and quite frankly, they're about to be destroyed. The British waited while severe rain fell for two days. After that, a very thick fog descended on the battlefield. British patrols edged forward and saw there were no American pickets. They looked into the American lines and saw they were empty. After the discovery, the fog became even more dense. Washington was the last to leave, boarding a ferry with his army to Manhattan. American losses, three stragglers, five cannon, too heavy to move. No fog, no army. Washington's luck and Philippe du Contre. Yeah. French officers were showing up in America promised high rank by Congress. They were mostly unqualified, but bowied by their huge egos. The worst was this guy, Condre. He was arrogant and insufferable. He showed up at Washington's headquarters. He was supposed to replace Henry Knox. So Washington's best is gonna be replaced by one of the worst guys available. Washington's in a, in a quandary. I don't wanna insult the French. I don't want to insult Congress, what am I going to do? Well, Condre was taking a ferry across the Skilko River. The horse dashed onto the ferry and kept going off the other end of the ferry into the river. The horse could swim, but Condre drowned. Problem solved. This good and patriotic horse contributed to American victory. Washington's luck and General Charles Lee. I had talked about him. Um, Lee was a thorn in Washington's side, called him my dear general instead of his excellency, openly disagreed with Washington's strategy, found ways to disobey his orders. He got captured because he wanted to stay in this magnificent mansion that was too far away from the army. So the British cavalry came up and captured him. He returned in 1778, given a key role in the Battle of Monmouth. While retreating, Washington arrived changed the course of battle, and an explosive temper relieved Lee of his command. No more Lee, problem solved. Washington's luck in that battle. His forces attacked, Lee retreated, Washington gets rid of him. Washington's explosive temper, which he always tried to keep contained, was unleashed for all to see. Another arrow in Washington's quiver. During the battle, Washington calmly sat his horse in the midst of a huge British artillery bombardment. As usual, he's unhurt. And best of all, our troops fight toe to toe with the British and we win. Luck and Benedict Arnold. Again, Arnold's gonna betray us, gonna sell out West Point, gives the plans to Major Andre. A patrol captures Andre does a very, very thorough search and finds the plans. That's the only reason the plot was foiled and West Point was saved. If West Point had been lost, West Point was the key to the Hudson. That would have been a disaster. Again, Washington's luck. Washington's faith. We've seen how fortunate Washington was not to be killed at Monongahela. After the battle, he wrote his brother. Who did he give credit to? Quote, but by the all-powerful dispensation of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation. For I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot under me, yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side of me. It was not just the Indians who thought Washington had a higher power. When Washington spoke of God, he would always give all the glory to the supreme being who hath caused the several parts which have been employed in the production of the wonderful events we now contemplate. We win because of God. We don't just win because of our actions. We win because of our belief 
and our faith. Another, another example. I owe it to that supreme being who guides the hearts of all, who has so signally interposed his aid in every stage of the contest, who has graciously been pleased to bestow on me the greatest of earthly rewards. Washington is not thanking himself, not patting himself on the back, he's thanking the Lord. The apotheosis of Washington, that is the Capitol Rotunda, if you're standing there and you look up, that's what you see. That's George. On either side of him, he's flanked by female figures representing liberty and victory. The other 13 female figures symbolize the original states. Pretty pretty heady stuff. The painting is 180 feet above the rotunda floor, covers an area of over 4,000 square feet. The painting was done by Brumidi in 1865. The word apotheosis means literally the raising of a person to the rank of a god or the glorification of a person as an ideal. Washington most certainly would not have approved this painting and its depiction of him. Washington and Thanksgiving, again, who do we thank? We thank the Lord. That great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was. This is one of the keys to Washington. Whether or not he thought the Lord had protected him in these many battles, he thought, he believed his faith was that faith in God is God would provide. Washington's faith in the people, which was abundant. When British General Gage, bad guy, questioned the legitimacy of Washington's rank, he responded, you affect, sir, to despise all rank not derived from the same source with your own. I cannot conceive any more honorable than that which flows from that uncorrupted choice of a brave and free people the purest source and original fountain of all power. Washington was chosen by the people, not a king. Back to George and Martha. The love of a good woman can be a major part of a bedrock foundation for a man who leads a life filled with anxiety and danger. This was certainly true of George and Martha Washington. Throughout his life, Washington's most precious time was being with Martha and living on his farm. During the eight years of the revolution, Martha spent 50 months, more than half of the eight years, in camp with her husband. She spent that time tending to the needs of the battered troops. The richest, most powerful couple in America gave all their attention to the soldiers. They were ideally suited to each other. Of course, the folks on the right are reenactors, but they look pretty good. Washington and slavery, I think it's important to talk about this. Washington owned slaves, but believed that slavery had become a chronological error in time and would soon be abolished. Three times in the 1780s, he favored a gradual emancipation scheme if one were put forth. Ultimately, he had to put the creation of a unified nation first, hoping that the near future would spell the end of slavery. Washington was the only founding father to free his slaves. The complications of ownership, some were his, Martha's, their kids and grandkids, prevented them from being freed sooner. Upon his death, the slaves were freed, but not abandoned. The older slaves were cared for by Washington's heirs. The younger slaves were educated, given skills, and looked after until they turned 25. Billy Lee, Washington's slave and companion during the war, was given an annual annuity. When I was in the Marine Corps, we had a saying, we have done so much with so little for so long, we can now do everything with nothing forever. When we look at what Washington accomplished over the course of his life, he did everything with nothing forever. His leadership in the armies he built defeated the most powerful nation on earth. 
His stature and reputation allowed learned politicians to create our Constitution, the most perfect how-to for a nation ever created. As president, he gave his character to the nation. If people of character followed him, our nation would endure forever. Why was he the essential American? Took a ragtag group of folks and, built and beat the most powerful nation in the world. Had the leadership and diplomacy to work with our French allies. Prevented mutinies, cabals, and treason. And he prevented the revolution from being set on a dangerous path, like France and Russia. Relinquished his command after the war, Cincinnatus, which when George III, King of England, learned what Washington had done, he said, if he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. Trust in Washington led to the writing of the Constitution. Only Washington could have served as first president. By delaying his retirement and serving a second term, he set the precedent for presidents. We began by asking why all the other founding fathers saw Washington as their unquestioned leader. They were all extraordinary men. None of them built and led an amateur army to victory. Had we lost, there may have been some clemency, but Washington surely would have been hanged. Through his military leadership and participation in numerous battles, Washington displayed a physical and moral courage above and beyond any other founding father. Only Washington inspired this kind of reverence and love of the people. Only he could oversee the writing of the Constitution. Only he, because he had, like Cincinnati, given up powers, could be the president. Washington always sought to be in service to his God, the people, his soldiers, and the nation. He was never in service to himself, always to others and to causes greater than himself. No other founding father had this unique dedication. Now, we started off by talking about Governor Morris. Remember that? 1791, President Washington appointed Morris as the minister to France. The familiarity and hand on the shoulder four years previously did not prevent Washington from choosing the most qualified person. Morris eulogized Washington on December 31st, 1799. Morris stated, his form was noble, his port majestic. So dignified his deportment, no man could approach him but with respect. None was great in his presence. You have all seen him, and you have all felt the reverence he inspired. It was such that to command seemed in him but the exercise of an ordinary function, while others felt a duty to obey. Washington's life was dedicated to service and leadership. Without him, there is no constitution, no democracy, and no American nation. Any questions? Go ahead. As a Virginian, I want to offer a defense of Thomas Jefferson. He said that he opposed slavery, or he didn't oppose slavery. Nope. But in the writing of the Declaration of Independence, he had a passage in which he blamed uh, the whole institution of slavery on George the Third. He has he has encouraged this controversy. He has, and that passage was uh, cut out along with uh, four hundred some other words mm -hmm. of the of the Declaration. Uh, because they, uh, 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 John Adams said we will lose a sound if this passage stays in here. So that seems that, that seems contradictory to the idea that he opposed slavery if he put it into the Declaration and and for it for the Declaration to be approved unanimously, it, it had to be deleted. May, may I cordially disagree with you? Sure. He uh, owned many slaves, fathered many children with his slaves and did not free them. So I'm going to cordially disagree. You are arguing words. I am arguing actions. And his actions spoke otherwise. But I still love you and Virginia. <laughs> yes? Don't you think that, I mean, I think this is, a, as a history major, I think this is so important that 
those uh, founding fathers suddenly so have been were exposed to the Roman yeah, and the Greek, the Greek democracies and the Roman leaders, and it seems to keep coming up, and they use them like Cincinnati mm -hmm. and Fabian and all of them. I'm so glad they were educated in history. Absolutely, absolutely. Too bad we're not anymore. <laughs> and classics aren't really mm -hmm. studied, but absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And please uh, spread the word about this incredible, awesome person. Uh, we'll soon be celebrating the 250th anniversary of our independence, our, the war, the whole shebang. So uh, you'll be hearing a lot more about this guy. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it.